Hello, everybody. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is December 14, year 2021, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And before I launched in, into this incredibly, my gosh, engaging talk, it's going to range pretty widely. And uh, please forgive me in advance. I'll warn you that I'm going, I'm going to be going through all sort of curly Q types of uh, um, roots here. It's not going to be so linear as many of you, um, not many of you, some of you prefer. But I make no apologies for that because these issues are so cross-hatched with different types of information, interpretive strategies and, and cross-references that that's just the way it has to be. But I promise you by the end of this talk, you will have a more, I guess, synthesized understanding of the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. And in a larger sense, I think you're going to understand what we're going through right here in 2021, because the thesis that I am proposing here for the first time publicly, and you right here live, are going to be hearing it. And yes, I'm still working it out. I'm still trying to refine it but I'm going to publicly declaim the fact that we are under what I call social dissociation. We are part of now a dissociative society, not permanently, not per it's not, it's not gonna be a lockdown situation, but we're gonna to have to really trace back through history how we got to this point so that we can unwind it. It can happen, but first of all, we have to go through this process. And um, it's quite pleasing uh, to me and to you, apparently. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. It's intellectually pleasing, but it's also, at the same time, historically and politically important. So we, we get a double uh, <laughs> treat out of this uh, exercise here. And I, when I say exercise, I don't mean this is just to be something idle. This is not a parlor game for you or for me. This This is important political... Uh, information and it's a prelude to this this surge of popular understanding of what is really taking place here in the United States of America and across across the world, really. So before I begin, let me welcome Melissa. This talk will be of special relevance to you because I'm going to be talking a little bit about. Uh, trauma and how a certain figure is being uh, in, in the history of psychology is being revisited after one century, 100 years. Uh, Monsieur Professeur Pierre Janet, J A N E T, has been relatively ignored in the psychoanalytic community. And so, what this means is that, you know, what we're doing here, it could, it may not bear fruit immediately. Hopefully, it won't take 100 years, but. The data will be here. The documentary she's already there. The books have already been written, including this incredible one by Lisa Heese that I was, I keep going through it. This will be on my permanent library shelf. And I'll be talking a little bit about this incredible work as well in conjunction with this whole idea of dissociation, social dissociation. Everybody's fragmented. Everybody seems to be on edge and, and anxious and and. The, the anxiety level is just beginning to mount. And all, she, all of you know here in the chat room that that's engineered, right? So how are we going to disengineer it? How are we going to unengineer it? Well, we'll work on that. It's not going to be, we're not going to come up to any conclusions by the end of this talk, but we're going to set the agenda for the coming months. So Melissa, welcome. Forged, welcome. Kathy, Sue, yes. Oh my gosh. we're <laughs> Yeah, it's rain soaked. It was raining up here and it's finally the sun is broken. It's still cold, but I guess it's, you're down in Southern California, up here in Northern California. I guess it's wet all the way at the West Coast, which is good. We need the rain. And uh, Ecat, how are you? Sean, how are you? Yes. The show is on, Michael. Charlie, welcome. Corky Goss, Leonardo da Ricci. Yes. Good, good to see you here. And who else is there? Oh, Piper Fogel. Yes. Hi, Piper. Good to see you here again. And C. Taylor. I think you might be new to the chat. Welcome, Thermobsterful. Good to see you here. 
and uh, Ramsi Rabi. I don't know if I answered your your Patreon message. I'll I'll do that if I if I'm I read it, but I had some kind of reference I was looking up, and uh, I might have forgotten. But forgive me. And we have a Detroit Dave Underdown. Incredible. Okay. I had a question for you about a family up in the Detroit area that's part of this Leslie Wexner uh, organization or that network that I came across in reading Kirby Summers. And, okay, who else did I not mention here? Deborah Johnson, welcome, Deborah. And Tom Colby, welcome. And 49453, okay, welcome. Jerry Beck, Ayape. Christy Liebel, welcome. A lot of people here today. Maybe it's raining in your neighborhood, so you, have to, you want to watch some YouTube, some live stream. Well, you're going to be in for a thrill today. Okay, let's get into it. Um, you know, first of all, I want to thank, again, David Martin for an incredible interview. Um, and, you know, we talked about the Drivers book, uh, of course, Vince Foster being the focal point about it, the, the, the murder of Vince Foster, a definite read for you, incredible piece of research, very, very well, well, well done. And then I got, uh, as soon as I finished the interview, I got in, in, in the mailbox here, the second edition it has two extra chapters uh, of the assassination of James Forrestal. And this helped me understand how the NATO slash UN slash NIH, the World Health Organization, how that caliphate came to rule our lives in 2021. Well, the first Secretary of Defense of the United States of America was murdered, was assassinated. So they got him out of the picture. And it's been uh, a slow descent since, since then. But with all this great research that's coming out right now, my gosh. And with people now finally attuned to what's going down in the search of answers, I, I like our prospects. But let's keep up the momentum. Let's not um, spike the football yet. There's no time for celebration. Just time for more and more intense work. Um. Yeah, I want to apologize to uh, the author, uh, Kirby Summers. Uh, you know, I reached out to her and I uh, invited her onto the show. It looks like it's going to happen. Um, she knows, I hope, that I'm a real uh, fan. I guess I can call that fan. Uh, I appreciate the depth, the scope of, of her work. So I guess I'm more than a fan. Sounds kind of superficial, but I really understand the, the, the deep content that she's putting out there. But anyway, she... Um, objected to an epithet, that a crude epithet, I must admit, that I uttered in reference to her, even though in my defense, I meant it ironically. I was trying to be funny. And that's gotten me in more trouble <laughs> than trying to be serious, is trying to be funny with my big mouth. So Kirby, I, I, um, I apologize for that. And um, hopefully you'll, you'll be... Uh, uh, willing to come on the show. I think you will. And uh, I think we're going to have a really good conversation. And it's not going to be over the same old ground. Uh, we're going to range into some new areas because I think you're uh, you're you're just now beginning to um, go into a whole new realm. It's going to be, you're not going to be known as as the, the, the Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell person only. Right. And these are good books. I got mine recently. Let's see. Let me just flash it on the screen. I got the Epstein Project here. And I got this particular book, which was a comp compilation of some Reddit post or something. Now, this one, uh, buy the book for just to understand how she's evolved into writing this. But it's not really um, indispensable. Let's put it. This is this is a must read. The Ghislaine Maxwell. I also got this recently, but there's some crossover. There's some, but that's okay. There, there can be some redundancy, and um, you'll find some new information as I am all the time. And uh, wh what this also tells me and it encourages me, and hopefully yourself, is that citizen journalism is exploding. <laughs> there, there's no. We don't need John, Don Lemon of CNN. And speaking of CNN, you know, you heard the revelations over the weekend. It's a pedophile 
or a thievophile, technically, because they're talking about teenagers, you know, not that it's any better than preying on children, but I want to be technical. It's not strictly, uh, maybe it is pedophilia, but it's one major producer there. I won't give his name because he hasn't been uh, convicted yet. Um, but yeah, big, big major uh, blow to CNN, but most of you out there already know what they're about and why they're so insistent on getting their version of the truth, which are lies across. And we're talking, we're going to talk about lies here. We're going to talk about the mainstream uh, media, but also the independent media who are not guilt free in this. One of the reasons why our conversations are typically characterizes characterizes conspiracy theories because there are a lot of entities. Um, Lisa Peace mentions Breitbart in particular, especially after Andrew Breitbart was assassinated. Now that's a book that needs to be written as well. There are a lot of uh, so-called indie uh, conservative, some people might say right-wing media, which are guilty of producing fake news and uh, what I call re-traumatization type of reportage. And they said, oh yeah, I predicted this 10 years ago. I predicted this 20 years ago. And this is, yes, we're going to be in permanent lockdown. And yes, there's going to be this. And supposedly they're, they're warning us like some kind of Cassandra, right? Uh, I call it the Cassandra PSYOP. And by the way, there was an Operation Cassandra. That is foretelling the future, forecasting becomes a way of demoralizing you and also telling you what um, is coming down the pike. This information is being handled to these people, handed over to these people saying, yes, this is going to happen. They're going to drop in 2022, this and this virus on us. And, and that's supposed to be, you know, we appreciate that supposedly as a cautionary warning, but really that's not the intention. The intention there is to, to push us deeper into a, to a state of helplessness and uh, beware of that. Beware of the right wing, beware of the conservative. Uh, as well, because we know about the left-wing media and CNN and corporate media. Uh, but we have a lot of, not I'm not just talking about the poseurs uh, that, that have proliferated on, on TubeU, but I'm talking about the people who have tens, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of viewers. And it, people don't have enough discernment to figure out that they're being played by that media as well. Okay, enough for that editorial. So I Apologies. I hope you'll accept um, Miss Summers. Um, you know, what I like most about her book before we begin is that, and this is the most important takeaway point, is that she is one person who's figured out that, hey, my personal issues or trauma, if you will, are related to a larger political historical realm. She made that connection. And this is what I hope to achieve on this channel. That is, none of us, you, me, whoever it is, are living in isolation with our own hurts, our own traumas, our own struggles. And that's been my primary beef against psychotherapy from the very beginning. By the way, Kirby Summers, I read this in the one of these books. This, I think it's this one. She's not into psychotherapy. She thinks it's a little bit... Uh, self-indulgent to be paying someone to listen to her woes and she'd rather work it out herself she's a big reader so and you can work it out through yourself if you read a lot of biographies and literature listen to a lot of music and talk to people um psychotherapy has its place i'm sure but um anyway my big gripe about that is you know books like this and you know i picked it up i'm trying to to figure you know had a interesting subtitles is understanding complex trauma attachment and dissociation, right? It has two buzzwords that I was interested in, trauma and dissociation. But the problem with this book is that it's locked into the individual. It has not made that connection between a huge network of demonic forces <laughs> that are uh, have been trying to take over the world probably from the very beginning, but they're very coming, they're coming close to uh, achieving their uh, millennial uh, struggle here. That's my biggest problem with psychotherapy, and it owes to Freud and to a large extent to Jung. But the good news is that, uh, as I told you, after one century of neglect, Pierre Janet is being rediscovered. And I'm finding this through journal articles, um, explicit reference to Pierre Janet and what he has to say about trauma theory. 
Uh, did you know that there's a Journal of Trauma and Dissociation? That's the title of it, Journal of Trauma and Dissociation. Uh, I just found this while I was uh, preparing for this talk. And it's the article is called Dissociation Trauma, a New Definition in Comparison with Previous Formulations. If you're a mental health professional, or even if you're not, you want to nerd a lot uh, out a little bit and read more deeply, I'll post a couple of these articles on my Patreon so you can see that, hey, the profession itself is onto this. So when we right now are talking about dissociation and trauma, we're at the cutting edge of what what's going on in the profession. And pretty soon in the larger population, you'll hear the buzz where it'll become trivialized like everything else eventually, but we'll keep it real. But you'll be hearing more about dissociation and trauma in the popular media because they're going to try to co-opt it. They're going to try to co-opt the term. They're going to try to create uh, you know, courses on it or, or teach us about what it's really about. We don't need to be taught. We know, we experience it, and we can find out ourselves if we have the proper pointers where to, where to check out. And that's part of my function, I believe. So um, let me move on here. Uh, let me just state there's one person for my money who is an exception to this rule of not connecting the per the personal with the political. By the way, that was one of the before feminism itself was taken over, was hijacked by the intelligence agencies, infiltrated by people like Gloria Steinem, who was set up as the editor of Ms. Man. You know that story. Uh, Bella Ab Abzug, all these other uh, assets, right, of the intelligence community. But when feminism was still organic and real, one of the common sayings was the personal is political. And I've always uh, believed that to be uh, a really important guiding light approach in my research and, and also in my own everyday experience. That is, whatever you're experiencing on a personal level, on a personalistic level, has its origins or its correlation at minimum outside in the world. So if you're feeling bad about yourself, it's not because something innate or even neurological necessarily, because that's what the neuroscientists are trying. It's all, it's all in the brain. Uh, and more likely it has to do with the fact that uh, your business has been shut down. Gasoline prices are going up to $5. Uh, you're told where, where, or where you can go, your mask up, on and on and on. These are political decisions that have been made uh, unilaterally and impose on us. So no wonder we have people who are in various states of dis... Now, that's a dramatic example, but in a way, it's good that we're being tested in such a extreme fashion because it's more easy to locate the sources of the problem. We know the problems are not coming from us. They're coming from Big Pharma. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. with his Children's Defense um, organization book names them in the subtitle along with certain couple of other miscreants including dr anthony fauci and bill gates so we know it's easier to see that yeah we're being bombarded here and therefore it's easier to see that the personal is political not exclusively but there's a very strong correlation there that and i want to look at the politics of oppression uh that's what i'm all i'm all about right and uh, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We're, we're getting close already. Um, so I'm using the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, uh, which was back in, uh, was it June 8th, 1968? 1968, supposedly, it was the summer of love. But man, it was a horrible uh, time. And uh, gosh, the Beatles broke up the next year. I think even they saw that you know what, they were becoming irrelevant to what was really happening in the larger society. And John Lennon in particular just wanted to check out and said, I'm sorry, but <clears throat> there's a lot more going on in the world and she loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, even though that they did a great last um, collaboration with uh, Let It Be, the Let It Be album, the Let It Be sessions, right? So this is a study in social dissociation, as I alluded to at the top of this talk here, specific, but it's specifically through the pivotal, pivotal event where it was all laid out for us to see, but only in retrospect, only through the intrepid reportage investigation of people like Lisa Pease, Dan Molday. She has some problems with his work, as I do. He did a book on the 
assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. There, and there have been other books about it. And they, they all have something to contribute. That's what's nice about it. Um, but I think the peace book for, for, for my purposes is probably the definitive study right now. And I keep learning more and more from it, which I'll talk about before we end today. So he was shot dead on, uh, well, he, did, he died several hours after, but he was shot on June 5th in 1968. Most of you know the circumstances. He had just won the California Democratic Party primary, which meant that he was probably going to be the, the Democratic Party candidate for the U.S. presidency. And you know all about the JFK assassination, and you know what would happen once uh, Robert F. Kennedy got the presidency. I think privately he'd, he'd already announced that he's going to investigate the 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 um, the factors or the causes, the the cabal, if you will. He didn't use that term behind the death of his older brother, right? Now, I mentioned last week that the convicted killer. And I say convicted because we not, we're not sure if he killed Robert F. Kennedy. I don't think he did. Um, I think it was either one or more gunmen that, <laughs> that did it. Lisa Pease uh, inc is inclined toward the argument that he was shooting blanks with, I think it had eight uh, rounds in the cylinder. And of course, there were multiple um, bullets or marks or rounds found uh, at the site. But anyway... Recently, the convicted killer, that is Sirhan Bishara Sirhan, was recommended for parole after many, many attempts to to um, to make parole or to achieve parole. And he finally he was granted it. And uh, the de final decision rests with uh, Governor Gavin Newsom. And we're going to see whether Governor Newsom is going to perpetuate the lie because the American people know the truth, right? But officially he might be called upon to perpetuate the lie that Sirhan Bishara Bersan acted alone and was the killer of the presumptive president of the United States, Robert F. Kennedy. Now the Kennedy family members themselves are split on this California parole board decision recommending Sirhan Bishara Sirhan to be released after decades. And by the way, if you have to ask yourself the question, why are we even doing this? Well, maybe an innocent man is going to be going free soon, thanks to decades of reportage and digging in and activism by uh, writers and also advocates. People like Paul Schrade have been instrumental in keeping the story and the research alive. And he was one of the victims. He was shot in the head. Not by Sirhan, maybe by Sirhan, but by one of the bullets that were flying in that pantry of the Ambassador Hotel where Robert Kennedy was guided after giving a very short uh, victory speech and going home to prepare for the next stop, which was going to be Chicago, Illinois. That would be an incredible, would have been an incredible uh, rally there as well. He was he was going all the way at the top, Robert F. Kennedy. Absolutely. So one of his one of the daughters of Robert Kennedy, though, denounced the decision on the part of the California Parole Board. And one of the cousins, Kennedy, I don't have their names off the top of my head, but I, I think it was a 60 Minutes interview, one of the network shows. So that goes to show you, even within the family, there are conflicts, uh, there are disagreements, right, about what happened. Because none other than Robert F. Kennedy Jr. studied the case carefully and he even visited Sirhan Sirhan in prison. And he came out in support of parole for Sirhan Sirhan. This is his father, his namesake. He's named after is his father. He's the eldest son. And uh, yes, it's this Robert F. Kennedy, you know. He's a, he's a mensch, okay? He's, he's real. <laughs> and I have the utmost respect for him and the Kennedy family, even if they might not agree with this particular decision. They've really made an incredible contribution to the American, you know, I know all the stories and all this, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But none of us is perfect. All right. I, I think, you know, it makes them more, more lovable that uh, they have this background and uh, 
e even the worst of us, not them, but the worst of myself, even we are capable of redemption, right? I could utter a, a, a really disgusting word and I can apologize for it and hopefully atone for my, my error. Um, so today's talk, again, I will stress, has a double meaning. Number one, I'm referring to the dissociative state of one Sarhan Bishara Sarhan when he supposedly shot Robert F. Kennedy or shot at him in the kitchen, the pantry of the ambassador hotel in Los Angeles. So he was in a dissociative state. It's not me saying that. That's experts who have studied the case far more closely than I have or ever will. So that's that's um, that's meaning number one, that particular dissociative. Okay, that's the specific individualized application of dissociation. The other meaning that I'm invoking is the generalized dissociative state of the larger the larger American public that has been incrementally, in, I'm sorry, incrementally led slowly by step by step, led through by television, mainstream corporate, CNN, Don Lemon, TV, Brian Setzer, and uh, the, the pedophile producer and whoever else is operating there in Atlanta, Georgia. Through television, the pharmaceuticals, right? Big Pharma is called out here in the subtitle by Robert F. Kennedy Jr., loves it. Uh, Netflix, Netflix, the education system. Oh my gosh, the teachers unions, the universities. My gosh, no wonder, no wonder. And my guy was, I was at the university system and I saw it over the years, more students going into, now I understand what's going on. And there's a name for it. It's dissociation. And I call it social dissociation. And it was frightening. The zombie apocalypse was beginning. And again, it was happening through the the uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. You know, I had to read uh, Dr. Russell Blaylock, and I had to study the whole critique of big pharma years and years ago to understand what was going on right around me. And of course, when the cell phones came in, my gosh, that further exacerbated the situation. And then when this mysterious fellow showed up in my department and said he was going to be the head of what we called community mental health, right? I'm not going to give you his name, right? But I'm sure these people are on every campus. But he showed up. And then after he introduced, he says, we're going to have community mental health. And what happened is that they started putting these therapists in all the faculty offices, including my department. It's a small department. Uh, that was that these are the handlers. These are the, the 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 women in the polka dot dress, right? That's in the Robert F. Kennedy case. The handler, the person that handled Sarhan Bishara. So now there's a handler for every student at Yale University. There, there's an a there's an administrator, quote unquote, but they're probably psych psychotherapists who are who are handling them through life, right? And this is why you started hearing a few years ago these complaints about uh trigger warnings and safe spaces. And, you know, that was a prelude to what is now being rolled out now. And those are real, by the way. Trigger words are for real, right? You, you know about the Manchurian Candidate and the, the playing cards in the movie and in the novel, the Queen of Hearts or whatever it is. Or um, in the case of Mark David Chapman, he was getting phone calls and <clears throat> And he, he was getting these signals, I guess, these trigger words. So those are, are real. But I'm saying is that this social dissociation phenomenon that we're living through right now, especially in this lockdown situation, it's been intensified, has its roots in this earlier power play that we see in, in the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy and other assass political assassinations. So these are traumatizing events. And as a child, as a teenager, I lived through them. I, it it became I won't say routine, but we we became used to it. The only difference is that some of us wanted to get to the bottom of we didn't we didn't just try to understand them or play them off as just random events, disconnected one offs. Right? Some of us, a lot of us, said no. We're going to probe this and try to piece it together, and we have enough of a picture together by now to know that we are, we have been uh, led down this 
this path of dissociation culminating in year 2020, 2021. Now it's time to break the trance, right? The trance formation, as Kathy O'Brien cleverly put it, <laughs> is about to be shattered into a thousand pieces. Like that phrase, shattered into a thousand pieces? Who does that remind you of? Yes, John F. Kennedy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, now, so now you understand the two levels of it. And um, in order to achieve this pedagogic uh, objective for today, I'm going to be screening a scene or two from a great documentary film titled RFK Must Die! Exclamation point, which came out in 2007. It was directed by an Irishman, not Irish-American, but straight up Irish. His name is Shane O'Sullivan. And a book by the same title was authored by a reporter called Robert Blair Kaiser, and that was published in 2008. Now, I'm not sure if if they collaborated on the movie because the book, the, the titles are identical, and Robert Blair Kaiser plays a, pro a prominent, he's interviewed a number of times, he plays a pom prominent role in this documentary, which is available on DVD. I had to advise you to get this because, as I'll tell you in a moment, well, I'll tell you right now, it's been scrubbed from YouTube. You can only get fragments of it, right? They've dissociated the documentary that tries to put it all together. So get it and get the book too. I had to reorder it. I had an original copy from 10 years ago, but it's on a hard drive somewhere. I couldn't find it. So I just reordered it and re realized how hard it was to get. After I realized how hard it was to get on, on YouTube, and I'm going to show you a, a segment shortly from this from this incredible documentary. Also get the book. It's available. They're both available used. Um, if you recall the talk with um, the conversation with David Martin in the background, I had playing the documentary Clinton Chronicles, right? Uh, pick that one up as well. That's another documentary that's going down the memory hole. It's really important to get physical copies or at least download this material from wherever you can. And uh, let's give uh, Mr. Uh, the late Patrick uh, Matriciana, right? M-A-T-R-I-S-C-I-A-N-A, -A -A, the director, the researcher for the Clinton Chronicles, which was released on VHS. Remember VHS? Back in 1994. Find those VHS. I got one. 10 years ago, and I transferred it to DVD. I have it. I have a digital copy. But hey, maybe I should buy all the VHS copies out there and corner the market. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but it's been memory hold, just as this particular documentary has been memory hold. And, not, and you're going to see why in a moment. Okay. Just for those, those of you who don't know, Sirhan, his full name is Sirhan Bishara Sirhan. I keep using all three of his names because in the popular media, the assassins always are referred to by three names. Lee Harvey Oswald, Mark David Chapman. So I'm following suit sort of as a parody, Sirhan Bishara Sirhan, even though he he was there, he shot a pistol, but it's as we know, it's questionable whether he hit anybody, right? But he was born in Jordan. He was born to a family of Palestinian Christians, refugees, who had been displaced by the imperial wars. They were being funded by the U.S., and I'm sure the city of London was involved, involved in some fashion there. And uh, they were uh, brought over to the United States, Pasadena. By the way, in Pasadena, California, that's also where George Hod Hod Hodel's people live. That's also the home of the Jet Propulsion Lab and and uh, Jack Parsons and that whole group there. I don't know if they had any connection, but uh, Sirhan Sirhan, I'll just use Sirhan Sirhan for short. Uh, he had an interest and he was a, a Jews paying member of the Rosicrucian Lodge in Pasadena. And by the way, there's another Rosicrucian Lodge up here in Silicon Valley, a hop, skip and a jump to uh, the the people who, who run... Um, the PSYOPs called IT, right? Or the mechanism called PSYOP, the, the DARPA net, right? Those people, the Pentagon, uh, which is now uh, uh, the uh, NATO, UN NATO Caliphate, okay? 
So in this milieu, uh, a young Sarhan Sarhan, as young as four years old, was being subjected to bombardments, commando raids, shelter in place, exercise, terrorist attacks, executions, assassinations going on, food scarcity. Hey, this sounds like 2020 to 2021 here in the United States, America, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, and France, uh, Canada, and all the other countries in the world that are now pushing back on this uniform NATO UN planned um, top down uh, takeover, this, re, you know, the ultimate last dissociation effect doesn't seem to be happening because only 20 people, 20% of the population are really, really, some say 5% are super, super suggestible. I won't say most, but about 20% cannot be uh, put under hypnosis under any circumstances. And that's you and me, the people here in live chat, where if we went to some kind of show and they try to put us under hypnosis, it's doubtful that it would take. But it does work in many cases, which I'll talk about in a moment. Now, the reason I mentioned Sirhan's background in, in violence and in Lebanon is that there is another mind-controlled assassin, the person who is in prison, who was responsible for, at least he admitted to, he pleaded guilty so there would be no investigation. He pleaded guilty to the assassination of John Lennon. This is in December of 1980. This is Mark David Chapman, right? He also had been exposed to extreme violence when he traveled around the world. He had worked for the YMCA as a summer camp counselor. He's a very, very uh, popular camp counselor. Um, and then more immediately, he worked for World Vision. He worked for World Vision in helping resettle Vietnamese refugees at uh, Fort Chafee, Arkansas, and he was also as part of World Vision sent to this battle-plagued area where Sirhan Sirhan family was, the Lebanese Christians and other displaced persons there. So that's an interesting parallel there. That's something that, of course, Lisa Peace couldn't pick up. But, you know, I'm familiar with these both these two cases. And that's a really, really strong connection there. And I looked up um, the United States Youth Council. It's a nonprofit, again, Anything with youth in it these days, 2021, that should be a red flag for you and me. Uh, they'll come up with another term, another meme. Maybe they'll have uh, uh, Ali Alexander, the meme, the self-appointed meme king, come up with a new formulation that'll fool everybody. Not really, because we know how they operate now. Uh, but anyway, this organization has 16 membership uh, organizations. One is the YMCA. Okay. And according to a New York Times article, 90% of the parent organization, United States Youth Council, 90% of the funds come from, guess where? The CIA, right? Which, of course, controls the YMCA uh, agenda. Now I understand the village people. YMCA. <laughs> it was to uh, support the gatum that they practice up there at uh, Yale Skull and Bones to try to normalize it in larger societies so that we'll think we're all just one happy family, right? The gay agenda is definitely, I'm not talking about homosexual agenda. I'm talking about the gay agenda, which is something quite different. Uh, by the way, I saw a documentary uh, yesterday, just so you know, I'm gay friendly. Um, not that I have to prove anything to you, but I did watch because uh, it was a cold and windy night. So I got into the blankets and watched a pretty good documentary called um, The Boy Who Made Shoes for Lizards. And it's a it's a story of the story of Manolo Blahnik. Remember Sex in the City, the Manolo Blahniks, right? And uh, our our favorite psyops, uh, British agent, double agent, uh, Anna Wintour is there. So is uh, the mind-controlled African-American uh, um, Friday, you know. They call it, Robinson Crusoe called him Boy Friday. That's not me, okay, or Girl Friday. <clears throat> but he was the assistant to Anna Wintour. Uh, Leon, uh, Andre Leon Talley was in the show. And it talks about, you know, his, his you know, Blahnik's rise to to uh, prominence with all the glitterati, Studio 54, the 1980s go-go Wall Street bust-out scheme, right? It's all of a piece there. So... Hey, I got my cred, you know. I, I know about uh, Jean Michel, the Basquiat, and Andy Warhol, and the the Village People, all of it, right? So don't call me a homophobe. 
Uh, I'm about as gay friendly as as, uh, as they come. Um, so anyway, let's move on here. Uh, I think it's time now to watch an excerpt from this shadow band documentary, RFK Must Die uh, by Shane O'Sullivan. It's about a, I don't know, eight million, or I'm sorry, eight minute in duration clip that begins with one of the classic films that is so often cited, you're probably sick of it by now. But for those of you who haven't seen it, let's take a gander here. And I gave her a cup and I made some for me. Uh -huh. Let's see. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get the programming at the time of the assassination and had no knowledge or memory of what happened or the programming process. Defense psychiatrist Dr. Bernard Diamond used hypnosis to recover Sirhan's memory of the shooting and explore his mental state at the time. We found out right away that Sirhan was a very apt subject. He went under immediately. He was highly suggestible. He recreated the night of the assassination, which he could not remember in a waking state when he was under hypnosis. One time, Dr. Dr. Diamond and said, Kaiser Sirhan, Blair. when I take out my handkerchief and blow my nose, you're going to climb the bars of your cell like a monkey. And then the hypnotic session was over. Diamond brought him out of hypnosis, and we started talking about a number of things. And then all of a sudden, I saw Sirhan climbing up the bars of his cell. And then I looked over at Diamond real quick, and I saw he's blowing his nose. And then Diamond said to Sirhan, Sirhan, what are you doing up there? Well, I'm just getting some exercise. He didn't know what, why he was climbing the bars, but we knew. We'd seen him programmed to do that. Sirhan bought two boxes of 22 caliber bullets at Lock, Stock and Barrel and practiced at a firing range for six hours on the day of the shooting. He bumped into a friend at Bob's Big Boy and challenged him to a game of pool, but his friend cried off and Sirhan drove down to check out the campaign parties at the Ambassador. He wasn't a drinker, but that night he had four Tom Collins cocktails and soon started feeling sleepy. One of the problems Dr. Diamond had was that Sirhan couldn't remember the actual shooting of Robert Kennedy. So he put him under hypnosis and had him recreate the night of the assassination. On Tuesday night, you've gone back to your car, you're tired, you had four columns to drink, and you're too drunk to drive, and you go back to the car and you see the gun on the back seat. Do you remember? I was hazy, Doctor. He went back to the hotel in search of coffee and met a girl by a coffee urn. She was sitting next to us. To the coffee urn. To the coffee urn. Oh, she, she was the one who gave you the coffee? She's the one that asked for it. She asked for the coffee. All right, then what? This is the girl in the polka dot dress. And I gave her a cup. And I made some for me. Mm -hmm. And we sat there. What did you call the girl? She tell you her name? She was tired too. She wanted coffee just as much as I did. Mm -hmm. All right. Did she tell you her name? Do you remember asking her? What did you call her? Girl? I don't know, sir. Coffee was all in discussion. Then she moved, and I followed her. Mm -hmm. Okay. She led me into a dark place. And led you into a dark place. Uh, was this where the teletype machine was? I don't know. No, she had in mind. What did you have in mind? Well, I was stealing it, so... Mm -hmm. You told me before what was on his mind that he ought to be able to screw her afterwards. Was that right, Sam? Well, yes, I was. You guess you were. No, well, empty rooms down there. What? Uh, empty rooms down there. Empty rooms down there. You were thinking of taking her into one of the empty rooms? Well, uh, why not? Sure, if it makes sense. Uh, and then what? It was dark. Oh, hell, it was dark. A lot of lights, too. Oh, hell, a lot of lights. This was consistent with what he said before, too. There were a lot of lights there, but he was in the dark. As a policeman. He's the one who had the funny uniform on, wasn't it? Had a uniform. But was it a policeman's uniform? Or you couldn't tell. It was probably a fireman, actually. I see. And then what happened? Damn. Huh? I was tired. All right, you were tired. I remember lying on the table getting that coffee. Lying on the table? Oh, putting coffee in the table. I had my elbows on there. On the elbows. Uh -huh. And I was twisting. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I was choked. Oh, wait, you skipped something. You skipped a lot. No, I choked because yeah. something happened. You, you happened. skipped a lot, Sarah. Well, it hypnotized me again. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Diamond said, Kennedy's coming into the pantry. What's happening? What's happening? And Sirhan, as if he's kind of replaying a movie in his head, uh, starts like that, and he reaches for his gun, only he's not reaching for his gun in his waistband where he said he kept it. He's reaching for his crotch. And he comes up and he, he, he squeezes the trigger kind of spasmodically, almost orgasmically. So there's a kind of Freudian aspect to this killing that he's kind of getting off on killing Robert Kennedy. Once brought out of hypnosis, Sirhan again couldn't remember. Do you remember where you told us where the gun was? I don't well, remember, you told me where the gun is. Point to me where the gun was. Five minutes ago, Sirhan, you showed me where the gun was. Go ahead, reach for it. Reach for it. Now, you had a long day, and you did very well, and you got us a lot of information. It won't help you remember all this. Uh, what I said at the beginning, sir. What did you say at the beginning? That I don't use that to follow me crazy. That we promise you. This is, you're not crazy, Sarah. You've been very badly mixed up. Okay, we'll leave it at that. And let me just interject uh, that um, Lisa Pease has some issues with uh, Dr. Diamond here. He's the professional hypnotist who had some sessions with Sirhan Sirhan. He's supposed to be on the defense team. It looks like he's 
he's convinced, according to P uh, Lisa Peace, he was convinced that that Sirhan indeed was the the killer. But nonetheless, this gives you an idea of his. These are audios. These are genuine audios, with the graphics put in by the director there afterwards. But it gives you an idea of the dissociative effect that uh, that was in play even after the fact. It's called post hypnotic suggestion. Now, I thought it was really rivetingly interesting to me when Lisa Peace cites a encounter that she herself had to to demonstrate that Diamond's assumption that you can't hypnotize people that were not susceptible. She went to the San Diego County Fair one year, and she happened to sit next to a woman and chat her up for 20 minutes until the stage hypnotist came on. And it so happened that she was called up to the to the front in order to be hypnotized with other people. And she was given a piece of paper saying that hey, the hypnotist told her, hey, it's a $25,000 check. And then suppose, and she was elated on, on, on the, uh, on the stage there. Everybody, oh, that's really interesting. You know, maybe she's a plant, who knows, but they were very amused by it. So after the show, she caught up, this Elisa Pease caught up with the woman who had been hypnotized and she was still in a post hypnotic state because she told Lisa Pease, Hey, I have to find the hypnotist. I got to return this $25,000 check to him. And she said, wait a minute, I thought you were snapped out of it. She said, she said yeah, yeah. What do you mean snapped out of it? I was, I was never hypnotized, but I have this $25,000 check to return to, um, to the, uh, the stage man, the hypnotist. So it, she witnessed it herself. And I'm sure, as I told you before, I'm sure you had uh, many occasion or at least one occasion to, to, um, to get your own place of work or school, wherever it might be to run into people who seem to be in a hypnotic or post hypnotic state. They're not drunk. They're not high. They just seem to be in, in a uh, sort of a trance like situation. And of course, my argument is that to varying degrees, uh, a lot of the American, if not, especially in America, especially the, the uh, English speaking world where, where the media and the internet is, is so integrated with our life. That's where you're seeing the uh, social dissociative effect that I have coined today because the psychologists themselves refuse to go there. But just as another example, and I thought this, this came back to me about how individuals can be both coaxed, tricked, coerced, and sort of hypnotized and tranced into committing murder. And this is something that you might remember. Back in 2017, there was a video circulating about two women that had run up on a relative of um, the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, and it was his uh, brother, his exiled brother. I guess there's a, maybe a battle for succession. His name's Kim Jong-nam. But be that as, as it may, we saw these two women, probably in their early 20s or so, Asian women, who ran up to um, Kim Jong-nam and put something on his face, right? And uh, he died from that. It, was, it turned out to be some sort of toxin. And according to this, the two perpetrators had been uh, set up in some sort of a prank, right? Like, I guess maybe that's why they have these prank shows, right? Like Jackass or whatever it is, or um, I guess that's kind of getting us set up to, to engage in some sort of um, unreal experiment, right? that is going to have devastating consequences because this guy, this um, Kim Jong-nam, this political successor to Kim Jong-un was, uh, was murdered thanks to this toxin. This, and these two girls thought they were uh, just playing a prank for the, for the benefit of reality television, perhaps. So that's the concluding chapter, by the way, and the most interesting one for today's talk it's called Mind Games. It's not numbered. It's called Mind Games. So go to that chapter if you pick up this book. A lot of the forensic information, I'd have to admit, is quite tedious unless you're a specialist and, and want to know every single last detail about it or most of the details. Uh, you could safely riffle through that without having to, to uh, check and double check. But her, her whole chapter on, 
on the mind, what's called mind control, I call it dissociation, uh, really helps to to uh, tie this all together here. Now we should be reminded, and, and this Lisa Peace does a great job at that, that um, people like Dr. Diamond, the psychiatrist and the psychologist were used by the prosecution primarily to cloud the issues, not to clarify, not to get at the state of mind of the alleged killer, Sarhan Sarhan, but to bog down the jury and all the minutia of psychology and psychiatry. And there's one individual, I'm sure most of the people in the live chat know this name, one individual that has been called upon multiple times to evaluate these uh, crazed, um, I mean that in uh, quotation marks, right? I'm being ironic here, just to let you know, crazed psychotic killers like a Sarhan Sarhan. There's one individual whose name kept cropping up. His name is a uh, Doctor, he's a medical doctor, Louis Jollyon West from UCLA. He's the same guy that went out to see uh, Jack Ruby when he was in prison, right? Jack Ruby, the alleged assass uh, assassination. Well, we saw it on camera. Most likely Jack Ruby did shoot Lee Harvey Oswald. Whether he was mind control, that's another article or book perhaps. But anyway, Jollyon West went to go see Jack Ruby in prison. It's the same Jolly on West who, after uh, more recently, it's been some years now, he went to go see Timothy McVeigh, the person who was convicted and then later executed for the Oklahoma City bombing. Okay, bombing. This was, He was executed in June 2001. By the way, Chandra Levy, because we were with David Martin talking about interns, right, in Washington, D.C., who turned out missing or, or murdered. Chandra Levy had some inside information about the Oklahoma City bombing, and she went missing two weeks before McVeigh was scheduled to be executed. So you see the intersection of all these different plot lines that are taking place here. But anyway, John, Dr. West, Jolyon West, went to go see Timmy McVeigh. And also, it should be no surprise to you that Jolyon West was also involved in the psychiatric evaluation of one Sirhan Bishara uh, Sirhan. Now, that's to me. Uh, an indication that uh, John Lennon West was the psychiatric cleanup man put in there to obfuscate, that is, cloud the situation rather than to uh, clarify, right? And uh, I agree with uh, Lisa Peace's um, uh, assessment there. Uh, so far as all these other characters, she draws heavily from the classic John Marks book. Is it John Marks? Yeah, I think it, uh, the In Search of the Manchurian Candidate, where people like Martin Orn, right, you know about Pro uh, Operation Midnight Cl Climax and all the LSD experiments, you know about George Estabrooks, you've read the book Poisoner in Chief, you know about the assassinations, the suicides, right, of um, various figures that... Um, have been ver you know, validated or verified uh, years after the fact. So we know this happens. We know this goes on. Now, uh, this is important as we wrap it up here. And this is something that was unexpected so far as I'm concerned. But Lisa Peace, um, you know, uh, I, I thought her politics were, pre uh, were fairly well defined as, let's say, conservative, right? Not arch conservative, but conservative. But she has a lot. Uh, to say about so-called, and I mentioned this at the top of this talk, but it bears repeating, but she has a lot to warn us about at the very end of this book. She says that um, fake news is to be avoided, is is to be shunned by every everybody on all whatever politics you are, and people in the conservative and the right wing, the independent media supposedly, are being manipulated by, by that particular constellation of media outlets, just as they've been manipulated by CNN and during the time of Sirhan Sirhan's CBS, NBC, CBS, um, ABC, right? All the, all the major uh, television networks. And there, the people on the right, the conservative media, up to the biggest ones you might ever think of, they're also guilty of tossing around these disorienting scenarios. So check out the, the concluding uh pages of the of the peace books so that we can break 
out of this chain of dissociation, right? You know the, the concept of a frenemy. Our enemies, really, we're looking at the Chacoms or looking at Anthony Fauci or, or Klaus Schwab or some of the obvious villains. But what about the frenemies? What about the the backstabbers, as the OJ is called them, right? Be careful of the, the hand that holds a knife, right? Uh, they could be helping to perpetuate a PSYOP. So with that, I will um, leave it alone. And I'm, if you have some idea of how I can get this documentary out back to the population, the larger audience, please let me know. I'm thinking about just downloading it to another channel and putting on private. I don't want to violate anybody's copyright intellectual property, but this particular documentary needs to be revived. It needs to be revisited. That's the benefit of, by the way, I don't think um, Peace talks about this book. I'm going to see if she references uh, Shane O'Sullivan uh, as she did Robert Blair Kaiser. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your kind attention. And I'll have something fascinating for you on Thursday. In the meantime, look at the RFK assassination. It'll tell you an incredible amount about our contemporary crisis that we're going to get out of, right? I'm sure of it. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Bye.